Hi everyone, I'm back in my home. And we're talking about movies, like we always do. This is all this is all we do here. So we're gonna talk about a bunch of movies that I saw in quarantine, because I've seen a lot of movies in quarantine. We are not talking about any of the Kubrick movies, because I already took care of that in the last video. So we are just talking about pure movies that I've seen over the course of the past month or two. Some of them are great, some of them are bad. Actually, only one of them is bad, and the rest are in between. So, let's just start off. Let's just get right into it. First is The Darjeeling Limited by Wes Anderson. Quirky, weird, funny, film director Wes Anderson, back in 2007, made this film right before Fantastic Mr. Fox. And I think you know me by now, when you go into a Wes Anderson film, or at least when I go into a Wes Anderson film, there's always a... A degree of expectation of enjoyment. I knew I was gonna like this one. I, it's Wes Anderson. I know I'm gonna usually enjoy what he makes, and this case was no different, but I didn't expect to really love it as much as I did. This was a great movie. Out of all the films that I've seen from Anderson in all of his filmography, this one's the most religious, probably. It's definitely very spiritual. It's meant to be about the growth of the characters rather than be about the journey itself. It's more about the development of their relationship over the course of the story. It's film's main characters are brothers who are basically trying to connect or reconnect after uh, being disconnected for a year after their father's funeral. The performances are all great and the chemistry between them feels very natural. The majority of this film is just these three characters interacting and a lot of the enjoyment comes from watching them and their bond evolve throughout the story. There's an actual progression, it feels like a real journey. There's an event that occurs in the middle of the film that helps reconnect the brothers. And while I do believe it's a little sudden, I do not believe it was cheap at all. I don't want to reveal what that event is, because it is spoilery, but there's an element of human nature to it. It feels natural and doesn't feel like a cheap cop-out or just some random thing that happens just to speed the story along. It feels in nature with the film's message itself. This isn't as meticulously crafted as the Grand Budapest Hotel or even Moonrise Kingdom, but you could see Wes Anderson growing as a filmmaker, improving on his craft. It's clear that this movie had more professional filmmaking involved as a, compared to stuff like Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou or Rushmore or even the Royal Tenenbaums. Like all his films, the cinematography is pretty fantastic and the colors practically leap off the screen. The set design and costume design are both great as well. The music was awesome and complemented the scenes they were in very well. There was also a soundtrack that was very well utilized. While this isn't as great as his later works, I would be lying to you if I didn't think this was a great movie, which it is. So check this out whenever you can, and I'll give this a solid eight. Next is Once Upon a Time in Anatolia by Turkish director Nuri Bild Ceylon. I I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. A while back, I watched his most recent film, The Wild Pear Tree, and while I thought it was visually breathtaking and legitimately well made, I did think it was a little slow, and by a little I mean incredibly fucking slow, in a way that didn't feel justified. Now that I've seen this film, I might have to go back and reconsider the quality of that film. I also watched his other film, Winter's Sleep, which was also great. But I think this film spoke to me much more than either of those two films. This is a film that is definitely slow and does have minor pacing mishaps, especially in the second half. But this is a legitimately fantastic film with breathtaking cinematography and an amazing sense of atmosphere. The story of this film is great and very interesting to watch unfold. A huge chunk of this film takes place in the pitch black night and these scenes are lit up using only the headlights of cars. I cannot tell you how many films that I've seen that have nighttime scenes that just feel so fake and unprofessional and sloppy. It was a legitimate breath of fresh air to find that this director knew how to film scenes at night well and make them incredibly atmospheric. The characters are very well acted and the conversations they have are incredibly interesting. They range from heartwarming and comedic to incredibly morbid, but they're all fun to watch. The cinematography is masterful. The shots flow very well, and the landscapes they visit never get old to gaze upon. Visually speaking, this film is actually flawless, but 
in terms of pacing, there are a few moments in the second half where a couple of a couple of scenes may go on for a minute or two too long. I believe if they shaved a solid seven to ten minutes off of the second half, I believe it could have really been maybe a ten out of ten movie. But aside from that, there's really nothing to complain about here. This is probably the slowest film I'll be talking about in this video, so if you do have a problem with that, then maybe I don't recommend this. But if you're someone who loves visually breathtaking films, this is an easy choice. I would easily give this a 9 out of 10. Very solid 9. What a fantastic visually, visually breathtaking film. Do not miss this if you're a fan of that kind of stuff. Solid 9 out of 10. Next is Ghost in the Shell, the famous sci-fi action anime. This has been on my watch list for a while, ever since I saw Akira a while back. And that was a pretty awesome sci-fi anime. That was honestly a pretty fantastic film that I enjoyed pretty much every second of. I loved that film. And sadly with this one, I just didn't feel as entertained as I did with this one, despite Akira being over an hour and a half longer, this felt slower, which was just weird to, to discover while watching this film. It's barely even an hour and a half, and yet this film was much more entertaining. There were certainly awesome action scenes and great sequences. I mean, the intro alone is a perfect example of establishing great atmosphere through almost zero dialogue and purely set, uh, purely setting and action and character development. It was honestly, the first 15 minutes, including the opening credits, were amazing. Literally, great start. But the movie kind of just went downhill from there. The characters are certainly interesting and the animation is unsurprisingly fantastic and some scenes are genuinely unsettling. The music was also really cool and fit the film very well, especially during the opening credits. Sadly, the weakest part of the film was the story. While the characters are interesting, I didn't feel connected to them enough to feel the gravity of the conflict. When anything bad happened to any of the characters, I just didn't feel the consequence. While I did love certain sequences, I just felt distanced from the characters and I wasn't consistently engaged with the story. I never felt bored, but if the movie were longer, that might have been a different story. This movie's barely over an hour and a half. It was an easy watch. I enjoyed it fine. I was a little bored here and there. I just was a little disappointed. I wish I really liked this. I'm giving it a strong 5, probably light 6, so let's just stick with that. Next is Koya Nishikatsi, and holy shit. <laughs> this is one of those films where I heard there's masterful music at play, and it absolutely delivered on that part, and much more. In a film without a concrete plot or characters, the music felt like a character all on its own. Running at just 85 minutes, this film feels much like a poem or hypnotic experience. The entire film is composed of carefully placed shots recording nature, machine, and the relationship between the two, mostly detailing how modern technology is taking a heavy toll on the earth. The title itself, Koya Nishikatsi, actually translates to life out of balance. But this isn't one of those sappy, humans are, humans are bad films that are incredibly preachy and don't say anything new or compelling. This film has zero dialogue. It simply shows you cleverly edited footage and it gets its message across clearly without treating you like an idiot. The shots in this film are absolutely breathtaking. Many of them are sped up, especially shots overlooking highways and cities at night, as if to represent the grid that humans created and now run on. In fact, the Criterion poster is just a miniature representation of that exact notion. Again, all these shots are accompanied by purposeful and incredibly dynamic music. I make no exaggeration when I say that the music is some of the best I've ever heard in a film ever. There are some very beautiful and mesmerizing sequences, but there are also some that are very haunting and downright eerie. There was a scene in particular that made me feel sick to my stomach. It was a basic scene. It was something that was simple, but it made me feel sick to my stomach legitimately. I mean, how? 
I legitimately don't know, but it was legitimately fantastic. I just said legitimately way too many times, but you get my point. It was, it was fantastic. I almost said legitimately again. Anyway, legendary film composer Philip Glass actually started his film scoring career with this film, and I'm hard pressed to find a score that I like more than Koya Niskatsi done by Philip Glass. I want you to keep in mind that this film was released in 1982, meaning that most of the footage was shot in the late 70s. And considering that this film was released almost 40 years ago, and manages to say much more about the effect that technology has on the, on the earth without any dialogue and just music and carefully placed shots compared to the preachy, boring, incredibly uncompelling films that do that same exact thing today, it's very telling. It's frankly incredibly telling of just how dedicated these people were to making this film great. While I heard the other two films in the Katsi trilogy, these two, weren't as great as Koyanis Katsi, I still am very excited to check them out in the future, and I legitimately believe that Koya Niskatsi, after three viewings, I've seen it three times, I am thoroughly convinced that this is my all-time favorite documentary. I refuse to call this film anything less than a masterpiece, and I refuse to give this film anything less than a 10 out of 10. That's exactly what this film is. A 10 out of 10 film. Next, let's talk about Polytechnique. I believe it's the sophomore film by seasoned veteran director, by now, Denis Villeneuve. This guy released one feature film every single year between the years of 2010 and 2017, and they were all great. Polytechnique is a film about the 1989 Montreal massacre in which an armed misogynist murdered multiple female students. This is a film that is very uncompromising and brutal, which is a style that Villeneuve has mastered by now. In this film, the brutal style is definitely in its early stages. Uh, it definitely isn't as well fleshed out as Prisoners or even Incendie, which actually came out the next year in 2010. With Polytechnique, I really enjoyed the cinematography. The tone is obviously great, as is the sound design. My main issue with this film is that it felt emotionally empty. Not at all to imply that the real event wasn't a tragedy. It totally was. I'm not trying to underplay how horrible this whole situation was. I'm just saying that as a film, I didn't connect to it on an emotional level the same way that I did with his other films. When the actual shooting was happening, I was definitely invested, but I wasn't like on the edge of my seat. And that mainly came from the lack of development of the characters and the kind of somewhat lackluster acting from certain performers. Everything about the filmmaking was good, no doubt. I think it's a very good looking film, but I think in terms of investment and sort of the strength emotionally behind the film, I wasn't as impressed, especially when you compare it to some of his later films like Prisoners, Blade Runner 2049, or even Enemy. So I guess this film just kind of lands on the good jumpstart, because after that he made some truly fantastic films. As much as I love Villeneuve as a director, I just believe that this film wasn't as great as his later stuff, which you should definitely check out, because I really connected with those films. I'm feeling a light, possibly solid six on this one. Next, we have The Painted Bird, a uh, film that premiered at various film festivals last year and has gotten a reputation of being a very sadistic war film. And, um, apparently there were many walkouts, a lot of 1 out of 10 reviews circulating online, and, uh, yeah, so I fr this movie wasn't frankly on my radar for, the very, for a very long time, until some trailers got released, and I kind of noticed that, hey, maybe this, maybe this won't be so bad. Maybe this will be an actually pretty good movie. Yeah, sadism, war film, not really my thing, but I have enjoyed weirder shit before. So maybe, maybe this will be, maybe this will be a pleasant surprise. And to sum up my thoughts, this movie was nothing to me. 
absolutely nothing. On the surface level, the film was decently shot, had some good production design and costumes, and the music was serviceable. That's it. This film is just non-stop sadism that served zero artistic purpose. And I'm not saying that violence or sadism has to serve an artistic purpose, but it has to serve some sort of purpose. And in this film, that purpose was non-existent. I didn't see it. If, if it was there, then I didn't see it. And frankly, I don't feel like re-watching this film to try and find it. It wasn't a commentary, so it couldn't have been that. It was based on a book that also has gotten the same reputation as being overly sadistic for no reason at all, so I'm not gonna read the book. I felt nothing while these sadistic scenes were occurring, and there's some really awful stuff here. The main character is played by a child, and he was only convincing, like, half the time. Selen Skarsgård was okay, Udo Kier was there for a bit. Surprisingly, the worst actor in the film was Harvey Keitel, an actor who's done some top-notch stuff in the past. His dialogue was very noticeably and horribly dubbed. Actually, there's a good handful of dubbing, and none of it was convincing at all. I just want to let you know that my review of The Painted Bird stops here, because I want to talk about a very similar film that's a way better alternative to this. And the cinephiles out there, all two of them, have figured out what this movie is already. And that movie is Come and See by Ilem Klimov. I'm, I think I'm pronouncing that right. It was released in 1985, and it's impossible to talk about The Painted Bird without talking about this film because it's very clear that it was somewhat, at the very least, somewhat inspired by Come and See. They both contain children, main characters, experiencing the horrors of World War II, drifting about, encountering different characters along the way. Come and See actually shows the main character, the, the main child character, before he's thrown into the war. He's clearly a naive boy, he has these delusions of patriotic grandeur, it's clear, his character is set and clear, and you somewhat, you do understand what he's like. The kid in Painted Bird, I didn't understand any of his, any of, any of it. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand any of his character. And I really did try, because I had the time. That movie was long, like three hours. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's get back to Come and See. He joins the Belarusian military, or militia, and from there he experiences the brutality of war, and we are experiencing that same brutality from the eyes of a child. Come and See is incredibly brutal, especially in the final 40 minutes. Legitimately one of the most harrowing films I've ever seen. And I think that's where Come and See succeeds compared to The Painted Bird. It doesn't play the brutality card unless it absolutely has to. Whereas The Painted Bird throws out brutal scenes every 10 to 15 minutes hoping that one sticks or something. And only like two scenes were somewhat effective. Not nearly enough to save the entire film. And I want you to keep in mind that The Painted Bird was three hours. Come and See was less than two and a half. That means that Come and See was more purposeful, contains war atrocities that actually have a point, and brutal scenes that aren't exploitive for shock value, unlike The Painted Bird. And probably the biggest strength to Come and See, it has a main character and a main child actor that delivers a pitch-perfect performance. I'm not kidding when I say that the performance from the kid in Come and See is one of my top five favorite performances. The kid who played him is named Alexei Kravchenko. He actually went through a lot during the filming of Come and See. They used live rounds for more than a few scenes and he actually recalled having bullets pass mere centimeters above his head. Alexei got so overwhelmed with the film's subject matter that his hair started to turn gray during filming, even though he was only like 14 at the time. The director of Come and See actually wanted to hypnotize Alexei in order to save himself the guiltiness of putting a child through such a horrible film, but that didn't work. An older Alexei Krepchenko actually plays a character in The Painted Bird. I'm not kidding, he was actually in the movie. It was quite a surprise. 
and I really don't know how to feel about it. He didn't do a bad job, but he wasn't in the film long enough to do a good job. So, I think this, I think the painted bird was making it pretty clear what movie it was inspired by. And I find it even more hilarious that it's ten times worse. I wanted to make this part of the painted bird review uh, an avenue in which to nudge you in the right direction. If you want to watch a movie that's about the experiences of war through the eyes of a child, go ahead and go ahead and try looking for one. Go ahead and try looking for a movie. I just wanted to make this part to nudge you in the right direction. I really am sorry. I know that this part of the video has been going on for a long time. I just remember being incredibly angry at the painted bird for just for just being nothing. It could have been something really effective, but it just came out with nothing. And that is not how movies about the experiences of war through the eyes of a child should be. They should be effective. This movie was not, and that's why I got angry. And that's why this part of the video is going on for way too long. In case you're wondering, Come and See is one of my all-time favorite films. It's a 10 out of 10 movie. I love it very much. It's one of my top 30 favorite films. Painted Bird, however, I'm giving a strong three, light four. I don't know. I, I really don't know. I'm never gonna see it again to reaffirm my feelings, so let's just say light four and move on to the next movie, because we're almost done here. Next up, we have Sexy Beast, the directorial debut of Jonathan Glazer. This guy recently directed Under the Skin, which has gotten pretty high marks from everyone that I know who have seen it. And I personally have not seen it yet, so I can't attest to that. Sexy Beast is a film about a retired safecracker living in Spain, and his old boss comes back and tries to pull him out of retirement for one last job. A uh, plot summary that you've heard. You've heard this story before. But this movie does something a little different. What really made this film stand out is that it's mostly Ben Kingsley's character trying to get Ray Winstone's character to do the heist. It's mostly these two characters interacting, and it's very entertaining. This film is a perfect example of incredibly entertaining and snappy dialogue. The writing is slick and brought to life by these very watchable characters. The performances are pretty fantastic, and I don't think I've been this entertained while watching Ben Kingsley. His character was incredibly fun to watch, and there are so many quotable scenes, but this film also has some great editing and some well-placed shots. It's got a good soundtrack, and the film as a whole has an excellent sense of personality. All things considered, it's the dynamic between Winstone and Kingsley, and Kingsley himself, that really carry this film. Luckily, pretty much this entire film, all 88 minutes of it, or most 88 minutes of it, is just these two characters interacting, and it's just incredibly entertaining, very quotable, it's very British, so turn on the subtitles, but it's incredibly funny. Add in some great filmmaking in general, and you have a pretty great movie. One that I'm giving a solid eight. Yeah. All right, the final film I want to talk about is Waltz with Bashir, the Oscar-nominated documentary by Israeli film director Ari Fulman. This is quite honestly one of the most harrowing documentaries I've ever seen. As you can probably tell by the footage, the animation style is very unique. Not only is it fantastic, but it manages to communicate a feel of a dreamlike experience. This documentary is essentially about the filmmaker himself trying to piece together his own memories of his participation in the invasion of Lebanon in 1982. Throughout the film, he interviews fellow soldiers who also participated in the invasion, and the stories they tell will leave you on the edge of your seat. They range from dreamlike and hypnotic to incredibly morbid and disturbing. All the while, the use of the animation makes the film incredibly visceral. It's dark, it's exhilarating, and truth be told, it's one of the most unique documentaries I've ever seen. As well as one of my favorite documentaries, it has also become one of my favorite animated films as well. And that's all I really want to say. I know this part of the video was short, but I really wanted to just leave this one brief, because I want you to check it out yourselves. It's really, really something. And um, I think I'm gonna go with a solid 9 on this one. Yeah, that sounds about right. If you made it to the end, thank you very much for sticking around. I'm sorry if this video was much longer than they usually are. I had some movies that I really wanted to talk about. And I also want to take some time to address why I don't talk about bad movies very often. 
because frankly I'd rather spend my time recommending review recommending movies that I actually liked rather than movies that I didn't like um, but I'll try and keep these videos more dynamic in the future I know that they're usually mostly positive and I, I like to sometimes rip some terrible movies to shreds and sometimes I like talking about movies that made me angry you know sort of display why I why they don't work as films for me so I'll, I'll start doing that in the future sorry if this video was just long I really did not mean for it to be that long I just had a lot to say about the painted bird um but aside from that thank you very much for tuning in as usual I um don't really I, I don't really have any big projects in the works just yet well I do but I don't I'm not really dedicating time to them dedicating a ton of time to them just yet I think I'll wait another, uh, I think I'll wait a few more weeks before I start working on my next big project. And I already decided what that big project is, uh, what I might start uh, working on. I won't reveal what it is until I'm absolutely sure that it's what I want to do. So, um, yeah, I think that's going to be it for me for now. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'm Cynic, the critic, I'm going offline for now.